The title of this audiobook is The Secret New Constitution for America. It was recorded on July 23, 1975. The author is political economist, author, and lecturer Dr. Peter Beter, the man who predicted and coined the word stagflation, and who is famous as the man who opened Fort Knox in September 1974. Dr. Beter was a lawyer in private practice in Washington, D.C., from 1951 to 1961, when he was appointed counsel to the United States Export-Import Bank by President Kennedy. After leaving the XM Bank in 1967, Dr. Beter became an international legal and financial consultant and a chief developer of international business in the Republic of Zaire. Further biographical information is presented in Who's Who in the East, The Blue Book of London, and other biographical reference works. Dr. Beter is also chairman of the American Patriots Committee, where he can be reached at 1629 K Street, the letter K Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 2006. Part 1. Subtle Warnings from President Ford On June 17, 1975, President Ford made some remarks that seemed to refer directly to the plans of the Rockefeller dynasty to take over America. Most of his speech consisted of crowd-pleasing rhetoric, and this is what you heard quoted in the controlled media. But woven cleverly through his speech was a sequence of remarks which paint a very different picture. Presidential speeches are not written casually, with meaningless remarks thrown in here and there. Whatever is said is for a purpose, whether it be to convey a public relations effect or to inject subconscious ideas that might be rejected if they were strongly emphasized or simply to have these things technically on record so that they can be referred to later as proving that no surprise was ever intended. Keep in mind that President Franklin D. Roosevelt used to say, and I quote, nothing ever happens in politics by accident." Unquote. Therefore consider carefully the following excerpts from his speech of June 17, 1975, and I quote again, In the months ahead we face a very critical choice, unquote, the preservation of free enterprise or a headlong plunge into governmental regulation. Now the words critical choice hearken back to Nelson Rockefeller's Commission on Critical Choices for Americans, on which President Ford served even after he became President. Nelson Rockefeller got the name for his commission from a book published in 1930 with Rockefeller financing. Its title was The American Rich, and it was written by Hoffman Nickerson, an associate of Nelson Rockefeller. This book argued at its, as its central theme that we would one day be forced to make a critical choice for Americans, namely replacement of our free republic with an hereditary dictatorship. Was President Ford cleverly telling us that this is what lies ahead within a matter of months despite all the pleasant words about an economic upturn just ahead? Another quote, From my travels, Americans have not arrived at a consensus for collectivism, unquote. And also, quote, We have not held a referendum, unquote, to repudiate our present system. But my friends, the consensus for collectivism he mentioned is exactly what the planned economic calamity ahead is intended to bring about in America, as I have explained in my previous AUDIO books. And why in the world would he refer to a referendum, which is not a normal procedure at all in America? For the apparent answer, look at Britain, which is further down the same road that we are now traveling. The national referendum made its debut in Britain in June 1975 just a few days before the President spoke. And the national referendum, my friends, 
has been widely identified as a symptom of the breakdown of representative democracy. In other words, it is a red flag that says, quote, the system is failing, unquote. Worse yet, as I detailed in my audio book on the Fort Knox Gold Scandal, a referendum is the very device by which Nelson Rockefeller hopes to bring his secret new Constitution into effect and make himself our dictator. In his speech, President Ford merely said, We have not done these things, but his implication appeared to be that we have not yet done these things things which should be unthinkable. President Ford also added that his administration is now seeking a new balance between the public and private sectors. But what new balance? A mixed economy with increasing government ownership and control of enterprise? He really didn't say. President Ford went on to say that he objects to those who, quote, those who criticize free enterprise and propose nothing in its stead." Unquote. Apparently it is okay to heap abuse on the free enterprise system that made our country great if you do propose anything in its stead, and the secret new Constitution written for the Rockefeller dynasty does propose something instead of free enterprise the virtual elimination of government regulation of the biggest monopolies and cartels, but total regulation and control over everything else. It would create a centrally planned national economy, which is exactly, exactly what exists today in such utopias as Soviet Russia, Red China, and Cuba, to mention a few shining examples. Thus, my friends, the signs continue to indicate, both publicly and through my confidential channels, that the secret new Constitution of the Rockefellers is still on its way. As I say these words, however, I do so against a background of events in the past several weeks which, for the first time, reveal that the four Rockefeller brothers are beginning to lose their grip on events. Nelson Rockefeller has destroyed his fair-haired boy image in the United States Senate by his own arrogant, autocratic actions as presiding officer. Furthermore, the worldwide gold corner by David Rockefeller has been thrown off schedule recently. The United States Treasury failed in June 1975 to persuade the International Monetary Fund to sell its gold because France now knows that the alleged huge gold reserve of the United States no longer exists. These and other missteps lately have prevented Nelson Rockefeller from seizing the Presidency as he had planned in June 1975 last month, and time is beginning to work against the Rockefellers in their takeover plan to the extent that tentative opposition is developing where it has been absent before. The Rockefeller plans, however, have now progressed so far, and the momentum is so great that they have already guaranteed the suffering of great economic hardship soon by many Americans. But if the American people continue to be aroused from their slumber, as has just begun in recent weeks, our beloved nation can still be rescued from the dictatorial clutches of the Rockefeller dynasty in time. The key factor, my friends, is for you to understand what they are driving toward and to exercise your constitutional rights of freedom of speech to spread the word while you can. Part 2 The Source of the Secret New Constitution in 1964 the writing of a new Constitution for America began at a tax-exempt foundation with the misleading name Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, one of the many major foundations which are controlled and funded 
by the Rockefeller dynasty for their own purposes. At about the same time, by interesting coincidence, a drive began in Congress to call a Constitutional Convention, which I will mention again later. The people who took it upon themselves to write this new Constitution on our behalf were, of course, not elected representatives or in any other way our representatives. As a tax-exempt foundation, they were able to do their work on what amounts to a subsidy taken from your taxes, but you and I were never asked if we wanted a new Constitution written. Indeed, only a very tiny fraction of the people in the United States even know that it exists. It has been made known to practically no one except a select category of influential people whose views and interests generally coincide with those of the people who wrote it. The American people as a whole are still in the dark about it, and this situation is deliberate. It is therefore truly a secret Constitution. But you may ask, if so few people even really know about it, is it really significant? Does it really matter, or was it really just a harmless academic exercise? To begin with, if it was a frivolous exercise, there is no good reason why you and I should have had to subsidize it by paying taxes on behalf of the Tax-Free Foundation, which we do. And if it was not a frivolous exercise but a serious effort, then it is nothing less than a clear-cut effort to help undermine and radically change our entire political system in flagrant violation of the legal restrictions under which tax-exempt organizations are supposed to operate. Now consider the following facts. The secret new Constitution took ten years to write, drawing upon the efforts of more than 100 people. A preliminary version was published in 1970 and given exposure primarily in the limited circles I have already mentioned. But last year, in 1974, an essentially final version was quietly published in a book entitled The Emerging Constitution by Rexford G. Tugwell, the man who directed the formulation of the new Constitution from start to finish. It was published by a major publisher, Harper & Rowe but only in a token fashion. I was only able to obtain the book by knowing all about it and going straight to the publisher's warehouse. Personnel there informed me that the book had been printed only in a very small quantity, that it was sent out to bookstores only for a few short weeks, and that all unsold copies were then pulled in and stored in the warehouse. The purpose, my friends, is obvious. The conspirators wanted to be technically on record with publication of the Constitution. They can then say, in the event of exposure, that this is no secret. After all, we published it. The Rockefellers always play the odds, my friends. So long as only a very small minority are aware of what they are up to at any time, they know they will not be stopped. Only if awareness of this scheming becomes widespread are they in danger of being stopped. The version of their new Constitution, which was published in 1974 on pages 595 through 621 of the Tugwell book, is the 40th draft. During most of the time that the Constitution was being written, the Center for Study of Democratic Institutions was lavishly funded by the Rockefeller interests to the tune of $2.5 million annually. But now that the Center has produced what its secret supporters really wanted from among its several projects, the secret Constitution funding has rapidly shriveled to little more than a tenth of that amount 
and the sinner is apparently on its way into oblivion. Perhaps you will still protest at this point if you know the identities of the participants and say, but these are prestigious people. Why, even the Encyclopedia Britannica was completely rewritten in 1968 under the supervision of the top people at the Center. Regardless of anything else, surely such highly respected people would produce a constitutional model with great merit. Then I say first, to judge the product for yourself, based not only on the summary I am about to give, but on your own reading of the document itself, and on top of that they conclusively prove that their own total incompetence in constitutional writing in 1969. That year the personnel of the Center, the same ones who were writing the secret new Constitution for our nation, decided to write a little Constitution for their own use to govern their own activities within the Center. After months of acrimonious debate they failed completely, and the Center was then reorganized in a completely autocratic fashion. Having thus shown that they could not even figure out how to govern themselves in their own small think tank, they then proceeded for five more years in writing their prescription to govern us, over 200 million people. The man chosen in 1964 to direct the writing of the secret new Constitution was Rexford G. Tugwell, a prominent member and architect of Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal Administration and an advocate of the planned economy for over 40 years. When he was chosen to guide the writing of the new Constitution, there was never any question about the basic character of the document that would result. As far back as 1932, he stated that it would be a logical impossibility to have a planned economy within our present constitutional and statutory structure, modifications so serious as to mean destruction and rebeginning are required. These are the words of Rexford G. Tugwell. You may have noticed that we have I heard a lot these days about the alleged need for national economic planning, but you may not have realized until now exactly what economic planning really means. In 1932, in the depths of the Great Depression, the concept of economic planning was discussed in great detail by Rexford Tugwell. In his words, Planning is a process of predicting and making it come true, and he pointed out that unaccustomed limitations on our activity cannot be escaped if our economy is to be centrally planned. In fact, he concluded that these limitations must be so great that, to quote him, business will logically be required to disappear. This is not an overstatement for the sake of emphasis. It is literally meant." Unquote. We also hear a lot today about the problem of so-called excess profits, and the very word profit is a dirty word to some people these days. And in 1932 Mr. Tugwell made it clear that it is in, in his view all profits must be completely eliminated as a part of economic planning, the supply of any commodity, including those on which you depend to live, would thus become strictly a matter of governmental allocation and dictation. Without profits, you see, no individual has any economic means with which to enforce and follow through on any independent decision. In such a society, your dependence on the government would be total and absolute. If our economy were structured that way today, you would not be hearing this message because it would not be in our ruler's interest for you to do so. There would be no such thing as an audio book talking to you about the Fort Knox Gold Scandal 
or warning you of the planned stock market crash in the very near future because AudioBooks Incorporated could not exist. Thus even such things as freedom of speech are tied directly to the freedom of our economic structure. Under economic planning, the government would not only control supply but would finagle demand to match through devices such as rationing, price controls, quotas, and what have you. But would all this nevertheless produce a kind of utopia for those willing to have their lives run by an all-powerful government? Of course not. Even Tugwell admitted, and I quote, We shall all of us be made unhappy in one way or another. For things we love as well as things that, they, that are only privileges will have to go." Unquote. Then what is his objective? Their answer is a godless kind of drab security of a sort which only looks attractive to people who are caught in a severe depression, such as existed when Tugwell made his remarks in 1932. Such a thing simply is not attractive to you and me in normal times. But should we have another severe depression, it might be attractive once again to a lot of desperate people. And my friends, this is why the crushing depression that lies just ahead has been planned and rigged by the four Rockefeller brothers and their collaborators. They plan to squeeze us unmercifully through unprecedented economic hardship, unrest, and turmoil. And then when the time is ripe, the schemes presented in the secret new Constitution will be offered as the solution to all of our problems. There are at least three different avenues which the Rockefellers have available for introduction of their new secret Constitution. Their primary plan, as described in my AUDIO BOOK on the Fort Knox Gold Scandal, is by means of a national referendum in the General Election of 1976. Nelson Rockefeller plans to be President by then and to rig his own re-election as President at the same time. A backup plan is by means of a Constitutional Convention. The authority for the Congress to call such a convention already exists, based on petitions which have been extracted from nearly all of the states. The excuse for this convention would have to do with apportionment, the so-called one-man, one-vote ruling of the Supreme Court. But there would be no way to prevent such a convention once called from becoming a runaway and completely rewriting the Constitution. The final fallback plan is the piecemeal introduction of the provisions of the new Constitution through amendments and many other means. This process is very much at work already. I think you'll be able to see from the discussion of the contents of the secret new Constitution. The piecemeal developments going on today are intended to prepare us to accept the new Constitution by making many of its provisions seem familiar to us. But should their plans to unveil the secret new Constitution overtly fail for any reason, they remain prepared to continue the piecemeal approach toward the same final result. But there is today a continuing drumbeat of Rockefeller-sponsored propaganda to make us believe our Constitution is obsolete and should be replaced. Even State Constitutions are under the same attack on all sides, always with the same theme, that they are obsolete, outmoded, unable to cope with the problems of today. The attack on State Constitutions all over America in recent years has been coordinated by a complex of agencies headquartered in Chicago, Illinois, which are dominated and financed directly and indirectly 
by the Rockefellers. Their most important target is not the State Constitutions, though. It is your mind. If you can be made to accept the idea that your State Constitution is obsolete, outmoded, and need to be rewritten or replaced, your resistance to the same arguments about our Republic's Constitution will be greatly reduced. So you see, my friends, the Rockefeller Dynasty hopes to celebrate our nation's bicentennial by replacing the freedoms guaranteed in our present Constitution with their own dictatorship, a cleverly disguised dictatorship. It has been made to superficially resemble the government that we now have so that we will not recognize it for what it is until too late. They are using every propaganda trick at their command to make us lower our guard, and they are about to put us all in a condition of economic desperation to persuade us to accept their cleverly disguised dictatorship. Part 3. Dictatorship in Disguise The United States Constitution, according to the preamble, is intended to provide for justice, domestic tranquility, our common defense and general welfare, and to secure the blessings of liberty not only to ourselves but to our posterity. These were the goals that shaped our Constitution, and this is the Constitution that enabled America to become a great nation of free people. But soon you and I will be encouraged to scrap our beloved Constitution and accept instead a new Constitution which has been written without the knowledge, much less the approval, of most Americans. The new Constitution has a preamble too, but it mentions not one of the objectives of our present Constitution. Instead of justice and domestic tranquility, the new Constitution seeks only, quote, good order, unquote, without defining what that means. The very first words are, quote, so that we may join in common endeavors, unquote and the body of the new Constitution makes it clear that this means an end to individual endeavors. The new Constitution is expressly stated to be good only for a prescribed period of 25 years. Our posterity are left to fend for themselves. No reference is made in the preamble to our defense or general welfare. Worst of all, the matter of liberty, so central to our present Constitution, is totally ignored in the preamble of the new one, which seeks only, quote, an adequate and self-repairing government, unquote. The emphasis throughout the new Constitution is on the government, not on the people. Adequate turns out to mean too powerful to be challenged, and self-repairing means that the laws and governmental structure can be virtually changed and shifted to permit anything our rulers wish to do. Before I explore some of the, of the details of the secret new Constitution, let me give you a bird's-eye view. Article 1 is divided into two parts, defining rights and responsibilities. It turns out that some of our present rights disappear outright, and practically all of the rest become conditioned and fragile, able to be terminated on the whim of the government. The responsibilities, however, which are obligations of the citizen to the government, are absolute and unconditional. Article 2 defines what are called the new states. 
The 50 States we have now cease to have any legal or political meaning at all. The terms of the new Constitution would theoretically allow up to a maximum of 20 of these new States, but according to my confidential information, the actual number planned is 10. It is no accident, my friends, that our Federal Government for the past several years has managed its, has managed its outlying activities through the 10 Federal Regions. Under our present Constitution, the Federal Government derives its powers from the States, which retain all powers not specifically given to the Federal Government. But under the dynasty's secret new Constitution, exactly the opposite is the case. The new States are completely subservient to the Federal Government and creatures of it. Articles 3 through 8 of the new Constitution define the independent branches of government and their powers and duties. Right now, as you know, under our present Constitution, the Federal Government is divided into three co-equal branches, the Executive, Legislative, and Judicial. They were carefully set up according to a system of checks and balances in order to protect our freedom from arbitrary government. But under the new Constitution there would not be three but six branches so structured that our present system of checks and balances are totally destroyed. The counterparts of our present three branches would be greatly changed and would be joined by the regulatory branch to control business, a planning branch to plan our nation's economy, and an electoral branch to oversee, monitor, finance, and regulate all elections throughout the country. All three of these proposed new branches are foreshadowed by recent and proposed governmental developments right now. Articles 9 and 10 discuss a variety of general provisions. Article 11 provides new procedures for constitutional amendments which are totally different from and more dangerous than those which now exist. Finally, Article 12 provides for transition from my present representative government to the new cleverly disguised dictatorship under the new Constitution. The secret new Constitution is about 8,000 to 9,000 words in length. Being the product of 10 years' work, the contributions of over 100 people, millions of dollars, and 40 drafts, every word has been chosen carefully and for a purpose. It is therefore very revealing to read it in detail, and I suggest that you obtain it and do so if you have the opportunity. But in the meantime, I want to open your eyes to its basic nature and provisions. First, consider the matter of individual citizens' rights. One right which is under powerful attack right now and which disappears in the new Constitution is the right to bear arms. Instead, and I quote, the bearing of arms or the possession of lethal weapons shall be confined to the police, members of the armed forces, and those licensed under law." Unquote. Regardless of what you may think about the ins and outs of the controversial gun control issue, you should be aware of the historical fact that disarming of the populace is always a part of any totalitarian scheme. Another right which disappears is that of the trial by jury. Instead, as defined in Article 8 of the Judicial Branch, a presiding judge may decide whether a trial is to be of the investigatory or adversary type. An investigatory trial is a type used, for example, in the Soviet Union. You are presumed guilty 
and must prove your innocence before a panel of judges. If an adversary trial is chosen, the judge is to decide whether there is to be a jury and how many jurors there shall be. There is no provision to prevent your jury, if any, from being a jury of one who, as easily as not, would be your bitter enemy, or possibly could be. As for how you might wind up in court in the first place, the section on rights provides that, quote, searches and seizures shall be made only on judicial warrant, unquote. That sounds reassuring until you discover that nowhere in the new Constitution are there any criteria given for the issuance of a judicial warrant. In other words, it could be completely arbitrary. The practice of religion is said to be privileged, but my friends, that's not the same as freedom of religion legally. A right is something which cannot be revoked. A privilege, however, is something you hold only at the pleasure of the government which can be revoked at will. Or consider the matter of property rights. It says, quote, no property shall be taken without compensation, unquote. But it doesn't say just compensation. The omission of that little word just after 40 drafts cannot be accidental and it would leave the government to seize your house, give you one dollar, and say, we gave you compensation. Finally, while this does not exhaust the discussion that could be given of the weakening of individual rights, the preoccupation with declared emergency is prominent with respect to rights. In Article 6 of the new Constitution, the reason and procedures for declaration of emergency are prescribed. Among other things, it says that emergency can be declared for no better reason than, quote, if an extraordinary advantage be anticipated, unquote. It doesn't say advantage to whom, but obviously it means advantage to the government. With this in mind, observe that Article I of their Constitution says that freedom of expression, of communication, of movement, of assembly and of petition are abridged in declared emergency. Peaceful public gatherings to discuss public issues may also be interpreted, interrupted or denied. Writs of habeas corpus are also suppressed in declared emergency, which means you could be locked up and held indefinitely without the preferring of any charges. With respect to the so-called responsibilities defined in their new Constitution, the potential dangers tend to be more subtle. I will only mention one example here, quote, each citizen shall participate in the processes of democracy, assisting in the selection of officials and in the monitoring of their conduct in office, unquote. Several points even in this one sentence uh, would permit comment, but simply consider the word shall. This, my friends, is a command. You shall participate, not that you have the discretion to participate, and if you do not do so, you would therefore be violating the most basic law of the land, the Constitution. For comparison, you are probably aware that, for example, in the Soviet Union, practically every citizen eligible to vote does, even though there is only one candidate for each office. He is quite aware that failure to participate in the Kremlin's brand of democracy would be dangerous as well as futile. Turning now to the new states, the basic observation to be made is that they are simply puppets of the Federal Government. Let me just cite one very interesting provision here, quote, 
If governments of the new states fail to carry out fully their constitutional duties, their officials shall be warned and may be required by the Senate on the recommendation of the watchkeeper to forfeit revenues from the new states of America." Unquote. You have no doubt already heard of various cases in which certain localities have been forced to forfeit the revenue-sharing funds because of failure to comply with Federal guidelines so-called. The provision I have just read you from the secret new Constitution is what this is leading up to. Turning now to the six branches of government under the new Constitution, consider first the counterpart of our Executive Branch, which is in the new Constitution. It's simply called the Presidency in Article 5. This is entirely appropriate since under the secret new Rockefeller Constitution the President is a, quote, strong man able to call all the shots. He is to serve for a single term of nine years. You may have noticed a single-term idea popping up lately, and even the nine-year length has been suggested by some in print and speech. The secret new Constitution is where the idea came from. There are also two Vice Presidents, one designated for General Affairs, first in line of Presidential succession in case of disability, the other designated for Internal Affairs, and second in line. There are detailed provisions for Presidential and Vice Presidential disability, with appointments playing a key role as in our present 25th Amendment, which was engineered by Nelson Rockefeller. A provision which exemplifies the power of the President is, quote, Treaties or agreements with other nations negotiated under the President's authority shall be in effect unless objected to by a majority of the Senate within 90 days." Unquote. Here is a pattern which permeates the new Constitution, wherein all sorts of actions take effect unless objected to by a majority instead of resulting from positive approval by a majority. This even applies in a matter of constitutional amendment, in which amendments get generated by the judicial branch takes effect unless turned down by a majority of the people. Under the Presidency there is also to be an ominous new official called the Intendant, whose powers are potentially those of the commander of a nationwide Gestapo. The actual wording, of course, sounds relatively mild to the unwary. The danger lies in what is not said and the limits that are not imposed. He is to supervise offices for intelligence and investigation as well as an office of emergency organization. His role here reflects a preoccupation with emergency that crops up again and again throughout the new Constitution. The word emergency appears 13 times in the new Constitution. It does not even appear once in our present Constitution. Constitutional provisions for declaration of emergency, of course, have been used time after time in recent years to terminate freedom in other countries. The Intendant is also given the authority to charter tax-exempt foundations or corporations that are, quote, determined by him to be for useful public purposes." Unquote. There is no check whatsoever on his authority to do this. This only reflects the unbridled authority of the President himself under the new Constitution, however. In an interview of Rexford Tugwell that was published with the preliminary version of his group's suggested new Constitution, he was asked how his Constitution provided for accountability of an unscrupulous President. His answer was startling and blunt, quote, it doesn't." Unquote. 
The new Constitution gives the President all the tools he needs to establish unchallenged authority during the transition period from our present to the new Constitution as described in Article 12, and I quote, The President is authorized to assume such powers, make such appointments, and use such funds as are necessary to make this Constitution effective as soon as possible after acceptance by a referendum he may initiate." Unquote. This open invitation for him to assume any and all powers he deems appropriate speaks for itself. Furthermore, with respect to the replacement of present governmental functions by those defined by the new Constitution, and I quote, the President shall determine when replacement is complete, unquote. Since only the President is given this power, there is really nothing to prevent him from simply freezing the process part way through. For example, after abolishing our present Congress and before appointing the new one, it is very possible that these two very short passages are the real crux of their secret new Constitution. But just to round out the President guarantees of invulnerability, the framers of the Rockefeller Dynasty's new Constitution also contains a remarkable license to lie in Article 9, and I quote as follows, The President, the Vice Presidents, and members of the Legislative Houses shall in all cases except treason, felony, and breach of the peace be exempt from penalty for anything they may say while pursuing public duties." Unquote. Of the three exceptions noted, treason is of no force or effect since it is defined nowhere in the new Constitution. Given the power of the President under the new Constitution, the rest would really have only whatever status the President allowed it to have. For your information, however, the Legislative Branch would consist of a Senate and House of Representatives as now, but there the similarities end. Senators would no longer be elected at all. Instead they would be hand-picked appointees of the President, plus former Presidents and Vice Presidents, and would serve for life. The House of Representatives would have 400 members but there would be only 100 Congressional districts. Each district would elect three representatives who would serve for three-year terms. These uh, would be expected to compete with one another instead of speaking with one voice, so this device would effectively undermine local representation at the national level. There would also be 100 representatives elected at large from the nation as a whole instead of individual districts. The at-large members would form the backbone of what little power is left to the House. They would serve for nine-year terms and would be the only ones eligible to become Committee Chairman. The Judicial Branch uh, would be presided over by a Principal Justice chosen by the President's hand-picked Senate. He would be a judicial czar controlling the entire judicial system of the nation with the aid of a Judicial Council and Judicial Assembly. The Judicial Council would be the originator of all constitutional amendments and would have the duty con to consider amending the Constitution to legalize unconstitutional steps taken by the government from time to time as provided in Section 13D of Article 8. The new regulatory branch is foreshadowed by many current developments. The July 1975 Reader's Digest even carries an article entitled, quote, Our Rottening Fourth Branch, which discusses the nation's regulatory structure as if it already were an independent branch of government. The most notable feature of the regulatory branch, aside from its grip on the nation's enterprises generally, 
is the blessing given to cartel arrangements called authorities. It says, quote, Member enterprises of an authority shall be exempt from other regulation, unquote. But as for the little guys who do come under the government's regulation, it says, quote, Non-members shall be required to maintain the same standards as those prescribed for members." Unquote. The standards prescribed would be those agreed upon by the cartel members, and non-members would not be allowed even to exceed those standards if they wanted to for competitive reasons. The planning branch is foreshadowed by the increasing clamor for economic planning by the present Domestic Council run by Nelson Rockefeller, by the National Land Use Planning Legislation which the Rockefeller interests are trying to push through Congress over the bitter opposition of vast numbers of alert citizens, and so forth. It would consist of a 15-member board appointed by the President. They would prepare six- and twelve-year plans and budgets to reflect the desires of the President, who would submit the budgets to the House of Representatives for their rubber stamp approval each year. Finally, the Electoral Branch is also on its way piecemeal through public financing of election campaigns, quota systems, and now the newly operational Federal Election Commission. Under the new Constitution, there is to be an Electoral Overseer in charge of the Electoral Branch chosen by the President's hand-picked Senate, and he is to, quote, supervise the organization of national and district parties, arrange for discussion among them, and provide for the nomination and election of candidates for public office, unquote. All electoral processes are to be paid for out of tax money, and no party can run candidates if it is not reorganized by the overseer. There are quota systems for apportionment of public funds that clearly would help drive out small parties and tend ultimately toward a one-party system. Furthermore, the overseer is to monitor, supervise, and regulate the election process completely. All the power necessary to convert elections into a meaningless exercise is provided in the, by the Electoral Branch under the secret new Constitution. My friends, to sum it all up, I can only observe that the secret new Constitution of the Rockefeller Dynasty turns out in the final analysis not to be new at all. It's actually a pre prescription for the oldest kind of government of all, one-man rule. It is this slippage backward into the bad old days of the past that we have seen increasingly during our lifetimes, brought about by increasingly ignoring our Constitution, which is still the newest idea in government. If we will stop allowing ourselves to be dragged down and pulled backward, by the crafty manipulations of the Rockefeller dynasty and those who work with them, we can indeed solve the problems that increasingly beset us. So the question is, are we going to celebrate our 200th anniversary in 1976 as the rebirth of our nation or as the death of our free republic? The American Constitution of 1787 was the product of distilling the experience of 5,000 years of civilization. Less than 200 years old, it is still practically brand new, especially since we haven't used it much lately. If God will grant us the option of doing so at this late hour, there is truly a new start we can make with full confidence in the results. That new start, my friends, is to pick up our present unique Constitution and start using it again. It would be the first time in your lifetime or mine that this was really done, and I am convinced 
we would all be pleasantly astonished at the results. This is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and God bless each and every one of you.